guys. Well, I'm sitting as you just have a high torso. <laughs> like, do you want me to ache for the rest of the day? Yeah. <laughs> it hurts my butt if I sit like that. Okay, fine. We'll both slouch. No, just be normal. Just be normal. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said I love you first. That is true. I did, and I, said, I did not get a return. Thank you. <laughs> but I got her back recently because she said I love you to me, and I said you're welcome. Got the feeling I'm a baller, like the star up in the blue, like I was falling off Niagara in a paddle boat canoe. I got the feeling I'm a baller, and it's all because of you. I was walking on a tightrope Touch me. Yeah, so Steven's signal is this. Okay, so t today, this is the signal. Not true. Not true. Not true. This is it. I really feel like it's almost 80% of the time things are exact. Let's talk about this right now. Let's talk about this. You don't want to talk about this? Love could never touch me. Yeah, I was riding high, but then my ivory tower toppled, and I tumbled from the sky. I got the feeling I'm a falling, and you're the reason why. I'm excited to do like little things, like go, sh well we can do these things now, like shopping together, but like, it doesn't mean anything, because when you buy milk, it's not for me, it's not. Well wait, no it is. Steven has let me know that he, because we see each other on late night, that he doesn't like seeing me in pajamas so much. That's not true, I didn't say that. It's so, I think he's mainly excited to see me in normal clothes, yeah. or no clothes. I'm <laughs> So I was hanging out at my friend's bachelor pad for Halloween and they lived on Lois Lane, so we called it the Super Manor. I was at the Super Manor. And I wasn't planning on doing anything, but I got a call from a friend who said that she had this dance party she wanted to go to. And I was a little bit nervous because, well, uh, I judge dance parties and I don't really enjoy them because usually they have really terrible music. But she told me, she assured me, that the music there would be fantastic and that people would actually dance. So I decided to throw together some haphazard co costume and I went to this dance party. And lo and behold, it had really great music and people were actually dancing. They had asked me to bring my iPod so we can play, you know, play a few tunes and uh, be the DJ for the night or whatever. So I dressed up, I brought a buddy and we dressed up. He was dressed up as a character from a Wes Anderson film, The Life Aquatic with Team Zisu. I wore these little teeny shorts uh, that are too short for men to wear. I got them in the boys department. Just say illegal. They're way too short. And he had a gun strapped to his thigh. And a little blue polo and a red beanie. And I was at this house and I was in my friend's room. We were, I was just checking up on him for a minute and we were watching part of the World Series. and. And I think Kristen had walked in with a friend that I'd met before. And I immediately thought Kristen was the best looking girl that had ever been in the Superman. No question. I was, I knew that I had to ask her out on a date that night. I asked him to take a picture of my friend and I. 
and I noticed that there was a baseball game on, so I made a comment about how I wanted the Cardinals to win, much to his chagrin. And that is like the only conversation that we had that entire evening. And uh, I, I did talk to her throughout the night. I know that Kristen probably said that I said like two things to her all night. That's not true. So I was DJing all night and I had to run, make sure the songs in queue were good, whatever. It's con it was sort of complicated, I promise. And uh, she just disappeared. Like I, I ran to change a song and came back and she was gone. And so I didn't even get the opportunity to ask her after that. So I talked to my buddy Mike and I told him that I wanted to get the girl's number that came with his friend Michelle. And so I texted Mike and was like, hey, can you please somehow get me the information for the girl that came with her? I can't even remember her name. It was like Christine, Crystal, Kristen. If it was Crystal, I probably would have not pursued her. So a week later, I get a phone call from my friend Michelle and she said, hey, one of those Life Aquatic boys wants to get your number and ask you out on a date. And my first thought is, if he couldn't ask me in person, then he, sh he doesn't deserve my number. <laughs> that was the best I could do. I mean, I didn't get a chance to ask her out. Of course I would have asked her out that night. But I gave it to her anyway. Um, but I called her. I didn't text her. I called her. So come our first date, we decided to meet up at a restaurant downtown and... Yes, I did show up a few minutes late. It was... The parking was disastrous and I should have taken that into account. So I called her like a, a minute or two before and was like, hey, I'm still a few minutes away. I'm trying to find some parking. I was very surprised when I saw him walk in. You know, I guess when you see somebody in short shorts and a blue cap with a gun strapped to their thigh, anything can really get better than that. But he had really, really great style. It was it, it was a very interesting first day. I We had a lot to talk about, I thought. I, I thought she was very interesting in the most positive way. I was very intrigued and attracted to this girl. Not, I was physically attracted to her from the get-go. I was drawn to her. It was very fluid and we had a lot of fun and we laughed. We were down at Eva's and we got some tapas, which was fun because I had never been to that restaurant and neither had he and we'd really liked um, trying out new, new restaurants and things. I was thinking, huh, this is, this is really nice. We talked about dinner, just planned on dinner, so that's all we were gonna do. And I figured that Kristen didn't want one of those typical Utah super dates where you go miniature golfing, and then you go to a movie, and then you go to dinner, and then you go get dessert, and then you go back to his house, and then he drops you off. I, di I didn't think she wanted that super date, so we just did dinner. When I got there, I had walked about eight blocks to get there. And of course, in typical Utah fashion, it was beautiful weather when I walked, and then when we got done with the meal, it was, snowing like crazy like the really really wet snow not the chick flick snow that's really light and fluffy it was it was really wet snow i had said i'm happy to walk you home and i thought that's where we were walking and we keep walking and we keep walking and we keep walking and finally we get across the street from temple square and i'm thinking in my head oh no he is not one of those guys I did not intend to take her to Temple Square. I thought she just was li lived further down on Main and then we are going to turn right or something. We're soaking wet, it's snowing really bad, and then he gets lost trying to find his car. <laughs> and After we found my car, uh, I pulled up to her apartment. The door to her apartment, is it's in the back and it's like dark and I didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable. And I didn't, so I didn't want to like, walk her to the door where we're in this like back alley and walk her down these stairs and like want her to, I didn't want her to think that I was going to try and pull that whole routine. So no, I didn't get out of the car. <laughs> I get home and my roommate turns to me and she says, well, looks like you'll never go on a date with him again. <laughs> and now I'm getting married to him. <laughs> so. On the first day we talked about going to this bookstore called Sam Weller's in downtown Salt Lake City. It was probably about a week later and I was set to leave for Spain the next day. He had asked me out, he said, let's go, let's go to Sam Weller's before you leave and we'll make sure that uh, we get that in and stuff because we had heard that it was closing. I went to Sam Weller's, had a great time, walked around and then went to the Beehive Tea Room and had some lunch. He couldn't eat in front of me because he was so anxious and nervous, which is really sweet and cute and he he started to grow on me. 
before Kristen left to Spain, right before she got on the plane, she sent me a text, which I thought was interesting. I thought that was neat. I, I appreciated that, and I thought that, that meant something. Not anything serious, but... And it was a terrible, terrible windstorm. It was tearing out trees, power lights, power lines were down. I mean, it was a really crazy windstorm. I just sent him a little text before I flew off, flew out of the country, and I just said, don't blow away, but if you do, please land somewhere cool. <laughs> I just said, I'll try not to, have fun, have a wonderful time, and see you when you get back. And then Kristen took off to Spain, now that I know, to see another dude. And I spent 12 days with some other guy in Spain in, in the hopes that something would work with him, but I kept thinking about Steven. Now I've learned that she had a, not a great time in Spain, and uh, anyway, so it was very natural. That's one thing that I noticed about our relationship was everything felt very natural. So we had been dating for five or so months. Like I said, we went a very steady pace. We didn't rush any of this. It wasn't this like second date, I love you crap. There was an ex-boyfriend that showed up at the beginning of April and he had made a proposal in a way of saying that he wanted to get back together and that he wanted things to work out between us, but he also wanted me to know that his life views had kind of changed as well. And it was around 2.30 in the morning. I got home and I was just so anxious and I tried calling Steven and he didn't answer his phone and so I decided that I was going to write him a letter and I was going to take it to his house and drop it off because I figured he was asleep. But I just needed him to know that in that moment I couldn't run fast enough to Steven. Kristen came over, she said, hey I really want to see you, can I please come over and uh, she came over to my house. And he didn't even ask why, why I'm calling at 2.30 in the morning to come see him and drive all the way from downtown Salt Lake to Sandy. And, I mean, that drive was so long. <laughs> it took me so long to get there when really I was probably driving way over the speed limit. <laughs> but I got there and Steven didn't say a word. He just opened the front door and he gave me a hug. It, up, up until that point, it was the greatest hug of my life. I knew, I knew something had been bothering her and so I just held her and hugged her and held her tight. Um, he didn't ask any questions. He didn't want to know why I was there. He just helped me. And it was in that moment that he told me he loved me. I, I knew that Kristen cared for me, but I didn't necessarily expect her to say it the first time because I knew that she was holding back a little bit. But yeah, I said, I love you. And, uh, and then she, and I think she just gave me a, a hug and a kiss. I had gone on a trip to the Midwest to see some friends and I realized how much I missed him and how much I missed being around him. I was turning into one of those girls, the girls that, that are just pathetic and sappy and just want to talk to their boyfriends all the time and just want to be with them and, and they can't go 10 seconds without texting them or calling them and, and I never ever thought I would be that way. So I got home and the next, in the evening and the next day he took off for Europe for three weeks. I couldn't hold it in any longer. I was just bursting with love for him. And, and so I told him then that night. So consequently, he went to Europe. But it was a really fun, it was a really fun moment. And he got, he got home from Europe and we had two weeks and then I left for Central America for, for five weeks. While Kristen was in Guatemala and Honduras for about a month, we had talked about things just being a little more serious. And I think, I think we both knew what was kind of was a, in the future, still a, a ways away, but um, in the future. And there was one moment where he said, he turned to me and he said, choosing you to be my wife would be the easiest decision I've ever made. I got her dad's phone number and I called him up one night and I said, hey Reed, uh, I would love to uh, come by and talk to you. He had told me that he was going to be available at 9.30 in the evening to FaceTime. So I called him up and, and he didn't answer. So I, I went up to Ogden and uh, got, uh, got there, said hi to the, to the family, to uh, Lana and Reed. And Reed was like, hey, let's go talk in the front room. We sat down and uh, he uh, looked me in the eye and he was like, what, uh, what is it that you want to uh, talk to me about? And I looked at him and was like, well, uh, would really love to borrow your boat. I, that, I, that was like my attempt at trying to like, laugh a little bit and like start start off with like a joke or something and it kind of didn't really work too well and uh no it went it went well and uh and then uh Kristen 
FaceTimed or Skyped home while I was there. So I called my family instead and I said, well, I'll just talk to you guys while I'm waiting for Steven to call me back. And as my family's talking to me, they kind of turn the iPad or laptop or whatever it was and they, they scan the room to show the people who are sitting at the dinner table. So I just kind of was like, hi. And she was like, what on earth are you doing in my parents' house? He had told me that he was going to be at his grandmother's house and not at my house. And so I immediately started accusing him. I said, you're a liar. I can't believe that you lied to me. Like, why did you not tell me that you were going up to my family's house? And why aren't you at your grandma's house? And he's like, well, I just decided to swing by and say hi, which is not swinging by because from Sandy to Ogden is like an hour long drive. And then she like really like needed an answer. And I couldn't lie to her. <laughs> And he knew that I was upset. So later on that night, when he finally did get home, he called me back and he said, I'm really sorry that I lied to you, but I just needed to ask your dad a few things. So that is when I knew that he definitely had the ball rolling on things. Um, but I had no idea when he was going to propose, so. So I essentially had to tell her. Otherwise, there was no future for us. There, we would not be able to proceed forward at all <laughs> unless I told her exactly what was happening. And uh, so I was like, well, I was talking to your dad about some things, like borrowing the boat. And uh, she knew what that meant. And so we went on this road trip like two months later. It was in August. And I knew that I wanted to ask her to marry me sometime on the trip. I thought it would be a great opportunity, but I didn't know where specifically. I hadn't been up to the Northwest. And we woke up fairly early in the morning to head out to Cannon Beach and then go up the coast highway, went up to Seattle. We are out on the beach, and in very Kristen-like fashion, I, of course, fell right asleep. Steven laid there for 0.5 seconds, maybe, uh, before he anxiously got up and started to go play on the beach. I, I wasn't sure what he was doing because I was asleep. A little while later, he has his shirt is filled with little black stones, and he says, I'm gonna go get my iPod. Now, he just got these brand new headphones that were noise canceling and were huge and kind of took up like half of your face when you wore fourth, them. A fourth. a fourth of your face. <laughs> he picked up his rocks on the way back out to the beach and he started playing in the sand with some kids. Okay, so my initial plan while Kristen was napping was to take these little black beach stones and to spell something in the sand and I had spelled out us forever question mark and I was I'm adaptable I, I understood that maybe they would wash away I was kind of hoping they would stay but yes when we got there they were gone <laughs> or those little kids stole them he comes back and he like taps me on the shoulder he's like wake up wake up let's go let's go for a walk and I'm like a walk I'm sleeping I don't think I ever tapped yeah, you did. You went, yeah. I think I just came over and you woke up. It was very natural. It was very natural. <laughs> it was windy, so we like I found some big rocks and I was just kind of like groggily putting things to the side and slowly coming to and walking down the beach. And then he gives me his headphones and he says, I want you to listen to this song while we're walking along the beach. And it's a Nick Drake song, which has a lot of meaning for us. Um, and we went walking along the beach to this area where he had been playing in the sand and and he kind of got a little dejected after a little while and I didn't know why. <laughs> so I started writing in the sand and I wrote I heart S and he finished it with... I'm trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wrote Skittles. Did I write yeah, Skittles? Yeah, you wrote Skittles. Okay, I'm like a five-year-old yeah. child. I like candy. I like candy. <laughs> Laffy Taffy, Skittles. So. And so we kind of laugh and then we keep walking down the beach. Later on, I, I keep writing and I, I wrote, I heart us. And thinking that Stephen was going to write something silly underneath just like he had with the Skittles thing. So I put an A at the end of us because it was close to the Olympics and I was just trying to be silly too. So, I Heart USA. And then he starts writing, I realize that he's writing F-O-R-E-V, and I was like, put an A at the end, like forever, forever, ever, forever, ever, like we all sing that now, cast song. So then he puts this big question mark at the end, 
and it hits me and I'm like, oh, no, not right now, don't do it. <laughs> and he, ha he holds my hand and I can feel the ring in his hand. And I was just thinking, oh no, not right now. Because one, I had just woken up. Two, I had these giant headphones on. Three, I had just messed up the entire like moment with Outcast. <laughs> and but he says some really sweet things, and then he he proceeds to ask me to marry him. And from there, this is where it get it gets interesting. This is it. I didn't say anything. I handed the ring back to him and I asked him to get down on one knee. Okay, back up, <laughs> back up. Kristen is traditional in some ways and very untraditional in other ways. So I struggle at times knowing whether I should go about things a traditional way or a non-traditional way. And this was one of those moments where I was totally okay with getting down on one knee, totally okay. I, I had always planned on it, but I didn't think Kristen wanted it at this moment, like for me to get down on the knee. So I didn't. <laughs> so I made him. And he gets down on one knee, and he asked me to marry him. And I said yes. He stands up and he hands me back, he hands me the ring. So I then hand it back to him. And I told him to put it on my finger. <laughs> which he did. So I totally, 100% commandeered the proposal. Um, you commandeered a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I think it couldn't have been more perfect for us because it was lighthearted and humorous and in a beautiful outdoor setting. And I mean, it was, it was perfect now. So we did a good job. After we're married, Really excited for daily jump starts. Jump starts are a lot of fun. Um, really excited about that. And the warm pancakes that come afterwards. Yeah, I'm excited to give her a warm pancake. Uh, just, you know, a couple times a week maybe. That'll, that'll for sure give me a jonker. And then he can be bejazzle me, which will be nice. Really nice. So, I think that's what we're most looking forward to. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, yeah. That's really it. But we, we've really come to learn what's most important. In a relationship. We're pancake lovers. <laughs> you can interpret that however you want. <laughs>